This is the show where we talk about horrible things, such as messed up folklore and murder and other crimes related to uh, people doing not so great things. I hope that was explanation enough. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Usually there's going to be some amount of gore, swearing. Oh, yeah. um, Usually murder. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yep. We try to keep this a little bit lighthearted, but it's it's hard yeah, sometimes yeah, it's, talking about bad things like this. Yeah. Um, today we're going to start out um, talking about my wall. I have a wall update. Hey, uh, hey what's a wall? Oh. My, my, my wall was wet last time. Oh, oh, yep. The moldy hole in the wall. Yes, please. Yes. It's now... Not moldy. It's resealed. Um, Good. The maintenance guy came by with a sledgehammer and just knocked it out of there. Uh, so that was cool. And now it's sealed, and I've had a dehumidifier in my room still. Almost two yeah. weeks later. <laughs> Are you like all dried out? Is your skin like? No, I. Oh. It's actually been off. Don't tell the maintenance man, but it's been off. I haven't turned it on. I just like I'm like I need to sleep at night, so Yikes. it's off Is unless it? I'm not here, oh. which I'm generally always here because I work here. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, nice. Well, I'm glad. So, what happens to a wet, moldy wall when you take a sledgehammer to it? Like, does it I just kind no of idea. like shrivel? Does it I don't shatter? Know. I don't know. Oh, I didn't. You- I didn't watch. Oh, I would have so gotten in on that. Hmm. I was busy making more coffee, I think. Cause of course. He likes to come in, like, I'll I'll make sure to get up early one day and be like, okay, he's coming in today, and then he doesn't show up, and the next day I'm like, he's probably not going to show up today either, and then I'll just be in bed at, like, 9.30, and he's like, hello, sorry to wake you up. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> you could have moved him yesterday when I, like, purposefully got up so you wouldn't wake me up. Like, come on. Rip. Yeah, I on Thursday he sorry on Thursday he learned his lesson and showed up later in the day. Like he showed up at like eleven. Mm. By that time I was like in the middle of working and I'm like, hi, sorry, I have to pause work. The maintenance man is here, even though I thought he wasn't gonna come today. It was, oh, a, gosh. it was a whole thing. So I'm just I'm frustrated that I like have not so great content this week. Yeah, yeah. What's uh what's going on with you? Okay, so one, um, the first case of the coronavirus in the U.S. to die was a woman in Kirkland. Yeah, I know. Washington. Yep. Why does the first case have to be, like, right next to me? I don't know, but can you check your audio levels? Oh, yeah. Yeah, coronavirus. Terrifying. But that's fine. Um, Also, I'm a hive of nausea and anxiety. And I don't know why. It's probably about my new job. I start working with kids. I I I love kids. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it, it's great. And also they're just so fucking weird. <laughs> like, oh my god, kids are strange. Um well, okay, so the highlights have been like just like sitting and shooting the shit with some first and second graders. That's fun. Um, low light has been when a kid asked me if I was pregnant. Oh, no. <laughs> I am so, so, kind of a side note, I'm so bad at knowing when people are pregnant because my co-worker was like, oh, uh, I can't sleep on my back either. And I'm like, oh, why not? Like, I have back issues because I slouch a lot. Mm-hmm. So, like, I have to sometimes lay on my back, but then I can't do that for too long. I don't yeah. know. It's yeah. a complicated relationship with my back muscles. Yeah. Um, but then they're like, you know, because I'm walking around with like a huge front load, and I'm like, oh, pregnancy. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> oh my God. And they're like actually like five months pregnant, and I just, 
I don't know. I mean, yeah, I feel like it's better. That sort of thing. I feel like it's better to assume that someone is not pregnant than that they are. I mean, maybe, but like, I feel like everyone else there knew that she's pregnant, oh. and I just never thought about it. Never. Looked. Yeah. I don't know. I just I'm not very observant. I, I guess. Mean, it, yeah. Yeah. But like that kid got me though. I'm like, wait, what? Is my stomach Am that big? It's oh. not. But um, <laughs> no, I, I know for a fact that I am not pregnant. <laughs> Good God. Oh, imagine if you of all people didn't know that you were pregnant, which happens. That would be a whole other story. Yeah. How do you mean? I just that would be an adventure to how you came to know you were pregnant and. If you had no idea how. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's why Jane the Virgin as a show exists. <laughs> yeah. Think about how much more inconsistent our podcast would be if I, if I was pregnant. Actually, it would probably just, like, end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. It would definitely on... end if I was, because I'd be like, mm, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, don't even. I don't like, plan on getting. Maybe it wouldn't. I just dropped my post-it notes. Okay. It probably wouldn't end because I would just end the pregnancy before I ended the podcast. I mean, yeah, true. Unless, yeah. unless I was like nine months pregnant and I didn't know it. And then it's like too late to get an abortion. Right. Legally. Yeah. Like if I was in a situation where like I hadn't known I was pregnant the entire time I was pregnant and I just popped out a baby, which is not how that works even. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just, I don't think yeah. I would end the podcast. It's not I, like those... Yeah. reality shows of like people like pooping out or not pooping out like yeah, popping out works. popping out babies in toilets yeah. and mm. not knowing until the literal minute their kid is born yeah okay. it'd be like umbrella academy where they just have instant pregnancy to birth oh my god that's creepy yeah. i would never i if that ever happened to me i don't know what i would do honestly I mean, honestly, you probably have to be abducted by aliens for that to happen. Which, I wouldn't be opposed to the alien abduction part, Wait. because I'd absolutely <laughs> come back with a story. Excuse uh, me? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, if one of the two things were going to happen, I would prefer it to be the alien abduction. Oh, oh, uh, you mean pregnancy versus alien abduction? Yes. Yes. Actually, I agree with that. <laughs> God. Uh, there was one thing I was, was going to say, and I don't remember what it was. It's not coming to me, so I'm just going to give you a date to put in that time machine. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Hopefully I don't get motion sickness Yeah, during this trip. Um, because... we'll, we'll teleport, don't worry about it. Okay. We're going to go <laughs> to June 1st, 1953. Wait. Beep, 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 beep. No. Yep. <laughs> Good enough. Oops. <laughs> On June 1st, 1953, we're going to go uh, and meet a little baby named Richard David Falco. Falco? Yes. Okay. Richard David, David, David Falco. Falco. Um, he was baby. born to unmarried parents, and his mother had to put him up for adoption only a few days after his birth. Um, his fair, his mother was previously married to a man with the surname Falco and decided to give her son the surname, even though she was having an affair with an unmarried man and Falco left her long before that. So wait, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. I just thought that Falco was the baby and not. And Falco not. was the baby. Okay. Okay. But and Falco didn't cheat on his mother. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I just got confused because you called the baby Fogno and then you called the boyfriend Fogno. Anyways, but I... No, 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 no. Okay, so the baby's name is Richard David Falco. Okay. And then uh, the mom gave the baby the last name Falco, even though that's not her first her last name. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because she was previously married to a man named Falco and was currently with a man with a different last name. Okay, okay. Um, and she's having an affair with him, but she just decided to give him... Falco as his last name. Okay. So, um, he's given up for adoption, and Richard David Falco was adopted by Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz, two okay. Jewish American hardware store, store retailers in the Bronx. Um, the couple was childless in their middle age, 
What a shame. Oh, wow. uh, changed the child's name to be David Berkowitz. So they switched the first and middle name of the baby and then gave him their last name. Okay. Got it. Um, David Berkowitz was troubled from a young age. He seemed to be very smart, but couldn't channel his energy into learning at school, um, being nice to people, and just kind of etc. right? Mm-hmm. And this reminds me of one specific kid at my school. Oh. <laughs> Rip. Okay, keep going. Um, hopefully this kid doesn't have the same future as this guy. Okay. Um, oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. So while he, he caused a lot of trouble, he never got in trouble with the law or had anything marked on school records. Um, his parents had consultations with at least one psychotherapist because of his behavior. Um, and they became he became super close to his mother, but she died in 1967 of breast cancer when he was just 14 years old. Um, this put a lot of strain on his home life, and his father remarried, which strained it even more. Mm-hmm. Um, they just he and his stepmom didn't get along very well. Right. Um, throughout his childhood, David Berkowitz was interested in petty larceny and starting fires. Okay. Uh, but too. I don't think he actually ever like acted on his infatuation yet. He just okay. kind of like was interested in it and mm-hmm. like watched films or whatever about it. Okay. Red books. I don't know. What do you do in 1967? Who knows? Well, in 1971, when he was 18, David joined the U.S. Army and served both on U.S. and South Korean soil before he was honorably discharged discharged in 1974. Hmm. After that, he went out in search of his birth mother, who he had never met before, and he visited her a few times, and she told him about the circumstances of his birth, which led to the, real- the realization of the string of unwilling father figures in his life. Mm. Um, like his, the, the man that his mom was having an affair with didn't want him. Um, mm. his like adoptive father didn't want him. Like, I, I don't want to say that they didn't want him, but just kind of like, they weren't great father figures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They weren't really willing to be in his life yeah. and like, it led, present they, it and led him to believe that he wasn't wanted kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this understandably upset him. Mm-hmm. So when he fell out of contact with his mom later on, he still kept in touch with his half sister for a while. I forget her name, but I had it written here. Mm-hmm. The problem with the articles that I read was that most of them stemmed from Wikipedia and like the sources mm-hmm. um, that are like cited on the page. Mm-hmm. And throughout my research of this, like over a month or so, some of these sources disappeared. Mm-hmm. And some of the text in the Wikipedia article also changed. So, there are a couple of things that I wanted to put in and then I mm-hmm. had to delete them because they're just no longer the wiki article um, mm-hmm. or linked in the wiki article. Yeah. So if I say something and listeners feel like these facts are untrue or what you read on the wiki page is not consistent with what I said, mm-hmm. that's probably why. Did they say why they changed it? No, I don't. I don't know. Okay. Um, but in the time that I was researching it, it was edited twice and like I had closed the tabs ready with all the articles. So I was like, well, fine. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, when he fell out of contact with his mom and kept in touch with his, with his half sister, um, David returned to New York and took on various temporary jobs. One of which was being a letter sorter for the U S postal, postal service. Mm-hmm. His neighbor just neighbors described him as someone who was a loner and who mainly kept to himself. Um, just overall kind of a quiet guy. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't call him a pillar of the community, I was but just gonna ask. You know, he's, he's definitely not at the bottom of the totem pole. Okay. Cool. Cool, cool. Quite yet. Oh. Um, yeah. On July 29th, 1976, uh, David Berkowitz shot 18 year old Donna Loria and 19 year old Jody Valenti in their car in Pelham Bay area of Bronx. Uh, of the Bronx, uh, firing three shots and then walking away. No. Donna died instantly, but Jody survived, stating in her testimony to the police that she did not recognize the man who shot them and gave them a description. Mm-hmm. The description matched a man that Donna's father said he saw sitting in a yellow car. Others also mm-hmm. testified that they saw the car driving around the neighborhood earlier that night, and um, he shot them around like 1 a.m. So Yikes. Okay. It would have been like... He saw the they saw the car driving around and then like early in the morning. Mm-hmm. Donna was leaving the car when she saw the, a man approach. The man produced a pistol from a paper bag, and then he crouched, 
and braced one elbow on his knee and fired the pistol with bro- both hands. Then he turned and walked away. Um, this is kind of a weird way of shooting this kind of weapon, almost if, as if he was firing like a longer gun, something like yeah. a rifle that needed extra support to steady it. Yeah, I like was thinking um, of like a hunting rifle or something. Yeah, it's just weird. Um, hmm. Or it's like he's shooting the gun from a, a firing uh, not a firing position, like a, a prone position where he's like laying on his stomach in the bushes or something. But like, yeah. I don't really know too much about this. But like, it just seems really weird, it right? That he'd be weird. in Was the he middle like of the street. Trying to just... hide from them? I don't know. Yeah. Still though, that can't. It doesn't sound like an easy way to shoot a gun. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Huh. Yeah. Um, Jody described their attack, their attacker as a quote, white male in his thirties with a fair complexion, about five, nine, five foot nine inches tall and weighing about 160 pounds. Mm -hmm. He, his hair was short, dark, curly in a mod style. And that's a quote that comes from Wikipedia. A mod style? It's a mod style. I I looked it up and I still can't describe it to you. I really don't know. It's like short dark curly i don't know okay um it's like really close to your head and like greased down i'm not really sure okay wait hold on i'm you gonna just Google write him it down for like, an insta idea find out what mod is okay mod a style? mod style yeah <laughs> mod style hair yeah what? apparently it was popular in london at some okay. point i don't know so the white male in his 30s with a fair complexion five nine 160 pounds. Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of agreed that's what they saw. Um, In October of 1976, on the 23rd, in a residential area of Flushing, Queens, a couple named Carl De Niro and Rosemary Keenan were shot in their car. The windows shattered and they immediately started the car and drove off, but they didn't know what had happened to them until they had contacted the authorities. Um, Were they shot? Yes. So that's the thing. They, They contacted the police and they're like, Hey, um, actually, Carl, you have a bullet wound in your head. Oh. Um, oh. What? What? Stress. What? Yeah. Oh. So the bullets were determined to be from a 44 caliber gun, but it was unclear of what type. On November 27th, 1976, Donna Massey, no, nope, Donna DeMassey, and Joanne Lamino, uh, Donna was 16 and Joanne was 18, and they were sitting on Joanne's porch in Belrose, Queens, oh talking. They're so little. Shoot. A man they described to be in his early 20s, wearing military fatigues, like a uniform, mm-hmm. uh, approached them, asking for directions. Mid-sentence, he produced a gun and shot each of them once. Mm, he no. fired towards them several more times, and they ran away. Neighbors that heard the shots rushed in to help, um, some seeing, like, a blonde man running. Mm-hmm. Uh... Yeah, running by them who gripped a pistol in one hand. Yikes. So this contradicts the description that was given earlier where like this guy had dark hair. Um, mm-hmm. Everyone here saw a blonde man. Mm-hmm. Um, Donna mm-hmm. Damasi had been shot in the neck, but she was fine. But Joanne had been shot in the spine and was paraplegic for the rest of her life. Oh, shoot. On January 30th, 1977, a couple were sitting in their car by the Forest Hills train station. It's like the, what do you call it? The the short form of like a long name. L-A-R-R. It's like uh, railroad station. Um, in Forest Hills. Acronym. Acronym. Thank you. I was going to say an analogy. That's not right. Yeah. Or an anagram. That's also not right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Forest Hills train station in Queens, getting ready to drive to a dance hall after ro- watching Rocky the movie. Um, Rocky the movie? Is that Rocky Horror Story or no? No, 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 Rocky, uh, the one with the steps. I don't know. It's like a fighting movie. Oh, okay, okay. A movie that's named Rocky. That's not Rocky. Watching the movie Rocky, is that a better phrasing? No, no, I just, no? I wasn't sure if, like, Rocky uh, was short for Have you Rocky never heard of Rocky? Story. No, no. Oh, my gosh, okay. Yeah. As someone who grew up in music, like, that was... If you're going to know a soundtrack to a movie, that was one of them. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm not cool like you. It's okay. No, no, no. I, it's just, it was a staple really? growing up, but now I'm like, I, I've never seen the movie. I just know the music. Oh, oh okay. Um, 
I had weird musical influences growing up. That we could talk yeah, about those later. I just liked really sad either boy bands or girl bands. Yeah. Boy and girl. Boy, mm-hmm. girl, or they band. Ever Levine. I, yes, Ever yeah. Levine. <laughs> I really liked Daughter in my moody teenage years. Mm-hmm. And still kind of do. Um, I don't think I know that one. A lot of just really obscure sad songs. Great. Yeah. Anyways. Uh, cool. So, this couple that were sitting in the car, going yeah. to uh, the dance hall after watching Rocky the movie, the movie Rocky, someone shot at their car around 12.40 a.m. Mm. In this car were okay. Christine Brown and John Deal. Uh, Christine was 26 and John was 30. Yes. Yeah, okay. So they drove away to find help, but uh, while... John got away with only minor injuries. Christine died later at the hospital. Oh, no. Neither had seen their attacker, but this is when police were able to connect two things about these shooters, shootings to, so far. Mm-hmm. One, all victims were shot with a forty four caliber uh, bullets, which meant that the, the uh, attacks were connected. And then two, all shootings seemed to involve a young man, sorry, a young woman with dark hair. So all the victims um, in every single attack there was a victim who had dark hair and was a woman ew yes that's really i i don't like that shit where it's like serial killers uh pick out uh people who look specifically like or it was specific characteristics i don't know why i hate that but like it, it wasn't like ted bundy or oj with the with the brown hair and the star of David necklace, like there was I don't one think big it's OJ. serial OJ killer. OJ wasn't a serial killer. What? OJ wasn't a serial killer. Wait, OJ wasn't a serial killer. Wait. Not that I know of. Do wasn't I know a different a OJ story from you? What? OJ killed someone, but he didn't kill multiple people. Oh, uh, okay, 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 okay. No, I, I, I get him and Ted Bundy mixed up sometimes. Okay. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I think it's because Netflix has two sh- or uh, one show about Ted Bundy and one show about OJ, yes. and they're always right next to each other on my feed. So then, oh. I don't know if that explains how my thoughts. Yeah, I don't work. know. Um. Anyways, <laughs> this man liked um, victims with long brown uh, hair. Definitely has a. T- this is the fourth shooting that they think is there that are connected to each other, and like, ah, uh, they already have a pattern. It's not great. Gross. Um, it is also important to note that this was based on composite ske- composite sketches from previous attacks, and the police thought they should be looking for multiple shooters, one with blonde hair and the other dark hair. Okay. Um, kind of feeding into like some people saw blonde men running from the scene and some people saw a dark haired man running from the scene yeah um i think this is yeah okay we're coming up to the one where people see specifically two people okay um yeah okay so on march 8 1977 around 7 30 p.m so like broad daylight almost like it's probably around sunset like sunset happened maybe like half an hour i don't know what is the sunset in new york in March. Like, probably? Six? Six, maybe. 5.30? I don't know. It's If you want me to look dark. it up, I can't. But it's still, like, the middle of the day. Like, people are on their way home from work. People are going out to dinner. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's 7.30 in the evening. But yeah. Everyone's still out. Uh, including Virginia Boskirchian who I probably butchered her name. She was a 19-year-old student at Columbia University, and she was walking home from class when an armed man confronted her. Mm. She tried to use her textbooks to shield herself, but the bullet passed through them and struck her head, killing her. Textbooks are literally useless now. Nobody witnessed the actual murder, but several sub- several suspects were given by, uh, like, descriptions of suspects were given by people who rushed to the scene, which was only a block away from where the previous victim, Christine Fron, lived. So he's staying in the area, uh, shooting people with the same gun. There might be two people. We're not sure. This is one of the descriptions that ended up getting deleted from the Wikipedia page, and the citation was deleted as well. 
Mm-hmm. But one of the descriptions given to the police was that there was a short husky boy who was 16 to 17 years old and clean shaven, wearing a sweater short and a watch boy. cap. I have no idea what a watch cap is. Who was sprinting away from the crime scene. Um, but there was also another young teenager that was hanging around the neighborhood, uh, a man who actually matched David Berkowitz's uh, description was also hanging around. And um, so they, they have a couple ideas of what this person could look like. And the media aired that the police claimed the chubby teenager in the description, the short husky boy, mm-hmm. was the actual suspect. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, That's just yeah. such a weird description. Short husky boy. Like husky in his voice? Or what does husky mean physically? Not quite overweight, but like severely overweight, but also not like super thin. Oh, okay. So That's like, what you call average build with a little bit of fluff. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So on March 10th, 1977, NYPD uh, had a press conference and announced that the same 44 caliber gun had been used in the De Niro and Keenan shooting and the latest shooting at Columbia University, even though the uh, evidence was later found to actually be inconclusive. But this was around when they started to dub Berkowitz as, or whoever was doing this, as mm-hmm. the uh, 44 caliber killer. Um, okay. they didn't really know much about his motives, but they believed that he was a killer of opportunity. So just like mm-hmm. whenever the opportunity arises, he's going to take the shot. I just had a thought. Yes. A story that I wanted to do in the future. Okay. That I you... dropped my post notes. What? I dropped my post notes. Oh on. no. Okay. Is this, what is this one? What are these? Oh, these are photo numbers that I don't need anymore. Aha! I can get rid of that. That's from last year's thing. Lay it on me. Okay. The Uber driver serial killer. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Oh, I'm writing it down. But why not? It. You gotta do, it. do it. it. It's such a good story. Yes. On April 17th, 1977, around 3 a.m., the dead of night, pure the witching peak hour. witching hour, yes, Alexander Isao and Valentina Suriani, Sur- we're going to go with that, okay. were sitting in Valentina's car by her home in the Bronx, where they were both shot twice. What is with the yeah. car? Why does this guy always shoot through the car? I don't know. Is this part of his MO officially? Probably. I think so. Nice. That's I don't know, because uh, he killed... Uh, was in Virginia in the middle of campus, mm-hmm. so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Or not in the middle of campus, but yeah. outside of her car. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so they were both shot twice. Valentina died at the scene, but Alexander survived until he got to the hospital, um, and neither were able to describe their attacker. Mm. The attack took place only a few blocks from the first shooting, so that one was in Pelham Bay area of the Bronx. Okay. I kind of triangulated where all these were, but I, I could not explain to you New York. Yeah. Yeah. So police suspected the same weapon was used in this shooting as previous ones. Their 44 caliber killer was responsible for the murders and might have been just one person, not two. The chubby teenager that people were describing was considered to be just a witness while a dark haired man who shot Donna Loria and Jody Valenti- Valenti was considered a suspect who actually performed the murders. So, like, if there were going to be two of them, one was the one who did the deed every time, and the other one just watched. Mm-hmm. Um, a several-page handwritten letter was found near the crime scene, dealing t- detailing terrible things and just honestly flat-out weird stuff that I don't even know how to summarize for you. Signed, quote, yours in murder, Mr. Monster. Oh, wait. Prime Insta. Insta Terry. Yours what? Yours in murder, yours. Mr. Monster. Fuck, I hate that. There's a picture of that on the internet, on Wiki specifically. You can probably oh grab it. Gosh. Psychologists who examined the letters who thought the killer might suffer from paranoid schizophrenia and described him as neurotic and believing himself to be a victim of demonic possession. This was around the time that behavioral psychology really like, made its entrance into criminal investigations, and psychologists observed that serial killers uh, seemed to gain gratification by escaping those who sought to watch them or contain them. Mm -hmm. Um, that they are known, but like nobody can pin them is a form of social power for them. 
Interesting. Okay. The fact that they aren't able to like get caught is like something that gets them off. Mm-hmm. So in May of 1977, two months after the Xiao Suriani shooting, a daily news columnist named Jimmy Breslin received a handwritten letter from someone who bl- claimed to be the 44 caliber killer, postmarked earlier that day from Englewood, New Jersey. There were four lines precisely in the center with the words blood and family, darkness and death, absolute depravity, and 44. Ew. Point forty four, which is forty four caliber. Ew. Um, like written that. out on the back of the envelope. This letter was signed Son of Sam. I don't like that. Sign Underneath the sign off were several symbols that combined to make a logo or sketch of sorts. Okay. Um, parts of this letter were released in an edition of the Daily News, thinking maybe someone could come forward with information and, and Police investigated DC comic letters, actually, because um, the handwriting looks similar to lettering in comic books, mm. but neither, uh, what do you call it? Lead. No? Nope. Methodology? I don't know. Never yeah. mind. Uh, there's a word for this. Either avenue. Got That's it. probably not either. I no one came forward and the lettering didn't lettering lead idea didn't pan out so um the only thing it really did was cause the public more fear so that's great (laughs) um on june 26 1977 sal lupo and judy placido were sitting in sal's car about 3 a.m when gunshots when three gunshots hit the car both were wounded but both survived and they told police that they had been discussing the 44 caliber killer when it had happened and they had not seen their attacker no i hate that one witness reported seeing a tall, dark-haired man in a beige leisure suit. Jeez, okay. Beige leisure suit. That's oh, how you say that. So like a and suit? another witness a man in mean? the same kind of suit fleeing in a car. The second witness was also able to provide a partial plate. Someone also reported seeing a blonde man with a mustache drive away in a Chevrolet Nova um, without its headlights and... This shooting took place in, like, the middle of the night, 3 a.m., right? So, like, having your lights off is weird mm-hmm. and also high-key illegal. Yeah. Um, on June 31st, 1977, Stacy Moskowitz and Robert Violente, Viol- Violante, I, it's violent with an E, okay. were shot in their car just shy of the date of the anniversary of the first shooting. They were parked in their car under a streetlight in Bath Beach in Brooklyn um, neighborhood. Yep, Bath Beach neighborhood in Brooklyn. When a man approached the passenger side for the car of the car and fired four rounds into the car um, and shot. Wow. Shots hit both victims, injuring them. Stacy died from her injuries and Robert lost one of his eyes. Ooh. This case so was headed up by Detective. Eye? Yeah, he lost one of eyes. Like, oh. he just has one eye now. Okay. Yeah. But, like, gunshot through the eyeball. Yes. Ew. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, this case was headed up by John Folatigo, who was told that he had to solve this particular case in two weeks, or else it would be turned over to the Son of Sam Task Force. Son of Sam. Oh, task Force. Fancy. He has a, his own task force now. Yikes. Yes. So a woman named Cecilia Davis was walking her dog when she witnessed a police officer ticking, ticketing a car parked in front of a fire hydrant. Immediately after, he, she passed a young man who seemed to be looking at her with interest and was carrying a, quote, dark object. Hmm. Cecilia felt something was off, so she hurried home and heard shots behind her out in the street as she reached her front door. Um, hmm. This actually turned out to be the Stacy Mos- Moskowitz and Robert Violente shooting. Okay. Um, she came forward four days after the shooting with her story, which prompted the, prompted the police to check the list of all cars that had been ticketed that night. That's mm-hmm. actually fairly smart of them. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, Cecilia's statement led the police to investigate a number of vehicles, including a 1970 four-door Ford Galaxy that was yellow. And it's actually kind of a cool car, but like oh. not cool that the specific one was used as a mode of transportation to murders yeah um on august 9th 1927 
Detective James Justice of the NYPD asked the Yonkers police to bring in Berkowitz, David Berkowitz, for an interview regarding their suspicion of his connection to the shootings. Um, because this car belonged to him. Mm-hmm. So the Yonkers police, Yonkers is not in New York City. That's not a county district area this is a completely different city okay as i found out with my geological geographical research nice um the august police surprised the nypd by saying that they had their own suspicions about berkowitz and that he might in fact just be the son of sam himself yes so he's not like an imposter he's not a copycat he's just like not an accomplice he is the guy guy doing all the things so on August 10th, 1977, police investigated David Berkowitz's car outside of his apartment at 35 Pine Street in Yonkers, New York State. Uh, they saw a rifle in the back seat, which spurred them to search the rest of the car. Uh, and guess what they found inside? A duffel bag of ammunition, oh. maps of the crime scenes, oh, wow. and a threatening letter addressed to the inspector Timothy Dowd of the Omega Task Force. Yikes. They decided to wait for David Berkowitz to leave his apartment before confronting him over risking a violent encounter within the building, which could disturb slash like maybe even harm other residents. Mm -hmm. So they, they wanted to wait for him to leave. Yeah. Um, and they also wanted to get a search warrant for the apartment just in case for a court justice person, because, um, technically they didn't even have permission to search his car. Unfortunately, police were unable to obtain the warrant by the time David left the building. So, um, they just decided to approach his car um, mm-hmm. when he got in at around 10 p.m. on the same day. And John Folatico, Fola, uh, he's like the lead detective guy, okay. um, approached the car from the uh, driver's side of the car, mm-hmm. while Detective Sergeant William Gardella approached from the passenger side. Both held their guns pointed, pointed towards David Berkowitz, and the alleged exchange between Berkowitz and the police went like this. Mm-hmm. Now that I've got you, who have I got? You know, said the man in the car, with a uh, what the detectives described as a soft, almost sweet voice. Ew. No, Ew. I don't. You tell me. I'm Sam. You're Sam? Sam who? Sam. David Berkowitz. So I don't know if that's the actual conversation, but uh, that is the alleged conversation reported to a newspaper. That's creepy as hell. He has a sweet voice. Mm -hmm. It's not for me. No. Yep. So the next morning on August 11th, 1977, after 30 minutes of interrogation, um, David Berkowitz confessed to the murders. He claimed that the Sam that he had mentioned being the son of in the letters was an old neighbor of his, Sam Carr, whose dog allegedly spoke to him and demanded the blood of pretty young girls. Wait, the dog said this? Yes. (laughs) Oh, God. Yes. That's like Um, the plot of the witch, but in dog form. Have you seen the witch? I, yes. Is that the one with the weird goat image at the end? Yes. Yeah, so David Berkowitz said that he was interested in pleading guilty and ended up pleading guilty to all of the shootings, even though his lawyers said, maybe you shouldn't plead guilty. Yeah. Um, he spent his time before the trial in a couple of different psychiatric wards, one of which, in one of which, I think is how that should go, uh-huh. um, someone attacked him, slitting his throat nearly all the way around. I mean, not great. No. But also, I can't say that he didn't deserve it. Yeah. (laughs) Or have it, yeah. Well, here's the thing. Okay. He wouldn't name his assailant, but he believed that he deserved it as punishment for his actions and was grateful for it. Wait, so it didn't kill him, or? No. Oh, okay. Wait, so. He lived. Okay. And he said that he deserved it. Okay. And he was grateful for it. So I mean, there's that. Nice. Okay. All right, dude. <laughs> yep. I don't know how um, he could do much better than that, but. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, there have been many claims from both outside media and Berkowitz himself about the cult he may or may not have joined in 1975, in which some of the members were allegedly involved in some of the attacks. Oh, God. Um, and did it say what cult it was? Probably. Okay. I don't remember. That's okay. But uh, some people thought this was true, considering, like the different descriptions of suspects that they gathered throughout the investigation. So the, the short husky boy, the 17 year to 18 year old boy, yeah, okay. the blonde man, like clearly there could be something else going mm-hmm. on. Right. Yeah. Um, but other people thought that this was totally bogus. Um, you like, there's no way it's just him like yeah. doing the, doing the thing. Um, well, other people were also saying that you can't prove it. So it's not true. Mm-hmm. Like there was just differing opinions throughout like the media, and, but mm-hmm. who knows? He also denied this later on, like that there was anything cult related going on. So okay. even though he said that, oh yeah, cult things, he also retracted his statements later on. So okay. I don't know. Interesting. <laughs> um, in eighteen uh, no eighteen eighty seven, a fellow inmate gave him a Bible. And after David read Psalm 34, 6, Berkowitz declared himself a born-again Christian and became an evangelical Christian while he was in prison. I don't know which Bible he was reading, but here are some translations of the passage that he was so inspired by. Okay. Should I be scared? No. Okay. Okay. So the one from the King James Version reads, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. Hmm. Harmless enough. Yeah. Um, the New American Standard Bible, the one that uh, is not revised, reads that this afflicted or poor, there's like an asterisk or whatever, mm-hmm. um, this afflicted or poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of his trouble, all of his troubles. Hmm. So similar, but... The afflicted, yeah. afflicted or poor man is different, yeah. um, mm-hmm. differently read. Yes. Okay. So then the revised edition of the American Standard Bible reads, the, the new American Standard Bible, sorry, mm-hmm. reads, look to him and be radiant and your faces may not blush for shame. So a completely a different, different translation. I don't know why it's so off. Yeah. So again, I don't know which Bible he read. Yeah. Um, but it affected him in such a way that he decided to become a born again Christian yeah. and asked to be called the son of hope instead of mm-hmm. son of Sam. So I get how he's trying to redeem himself, but it's like some things are just unredeemable. unredeemable. So I'm well, like, okay, so here's the thing. He also cocked, contacted people outside of the prison to help him set up a website to, to like help share his story and his teachings and it's very creepy it's like the weird like you know stereotypical like religious sunset picture with like bible quotes all over the website and he's got like um, a whole apology page like it's so creepy it's so gross that sounds like that man that i dated i don't date men anymore but there was this man that i dated who oh, he jumped me and then a year later he wrote me this really long apology that was so self-deprecating that it was, like, very obviously in his favor and not meant to actually apologize to me. And mm-hmm. then he tried to manipulate me back into a, a relationship with him. So that just sounds like that, but on a God level. Anyways, yeah. yeah. Wow. He seems like a gross man. I mean, yeah. in both my ex and... David, who's okay. the born again Christian. Yeah. Anyways, Ugh. okay, so I just feel like there's no really apologizing for this sort of thing. Yeah, and it's like really arrogant to even think that you that like this is a story that. Well, yeah. Yeah. To make a um, website out of it, it's just very narcissistic. Yeah. So this actually prompted a new law to be considered. So. There's a law called the Son of Sam law that whoever 
people proposed Mm -hmm. that states that convicted criminals can't make any monetary profit from things like books or movies related to stories about their crimes. Oh, that's where it comes from. Nice. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, So while this is not a federal law, because the Supreme Court struck it down in 1991 saying that it violated the First Amendment for Mm -hmm. free speech, similar laws have been put in place across the country in 41 states as well as at the federal level. Um, mm. I mean, like, not the exact law, yeah, but um, a similar one. And there's okay. been a number of movies made and books written about David Berkowitz, including mm-hmm. the show Mindhunter, in which Oliver Cooper oh. is a, honestly near, nearly a spitting image of the Son of Sam himself, um, complete with speech patterns and mannerisms. Whatever tapes he watched, he did a damn Ooh. good job of analyzing them and I, like, want to watch that, but that's also so creepy that I'm, like, I don't want to watch it. Yeah. There's also been a number of articles and stories written about his, like, quote-unquote influence from the dog. Like? His neighbor's dog, who supposedly spoke to him. Like, like, psychological? Or, or like, paranormal? Like, evaluating? Well, this is part of the, the cult theory, yeah. Like, he claimed that the dog was Satan or something and like was giving him directions. Right. Yikes. Which he also later denied okay. uh, and retracted. So yeah, I don't that's... know his new explanation for the son of Sam is that he's the son of Sam Hine, which is a Gaelic slash Welsh harvest season festival tradition thing. And it's like to celebrate the harvest, obviously, but you like dress up as, um, these like weird horse demons. It's really weird. I looked it up. Oh. It's really weird. <laughs> also, a fun fact: there was also a lawsuit involving the Kellogg Company, the cereal company, who produces Fruit Loops because someone made a comedy rock video called "Cereal Like the Food," uh-huh. uh, "Cereal Killer," in 1992 oh. that altered Toucan Sam's name to be Toucan Son of Sam. What? What? That's crazy. Oh, yeah. God. So, uh, they were is very it? much like, you can't do that. <laughs> is it? So they, they changed it, but it was, uh, yep. Is it, very is it Kellogg, the, Kellogg, the same company that was made, that was made to prevent boys from masturbating or something? What? Yeah. I have heard that story. There is a serial company... I, I'm pretty sure it's Kellogg's that made a cereal with the goal of preventing young boys from masturbating. I don't think it was Fruit Loops. No, no, but like Kellogg's cereal, like in the in the 30s or something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, he's known for promotion of circumcision circumcision to stop. Children from masturbating. It's oh. not necessarily the cereal for it, but he happened to. No, you're right. Oh my god! I, Many yeah. vegetarian foods that Kellogg developed and offered his patients were publicly marketed. Kellogg is best known today for the invention of breakfast cereal corn flakes, originally d- intended to be an anaphrodisiac. Oh my god! <laughs> The more you know, dude. This guy just cares way too much about about young people's genitals. You know? Hello, Mr. Kellogg. I'm I, never eating cornflakes ever again. I'm sorry. Yeah. I I really want to try to talk about this at some point on our podcast, but I don't know how I can. I don't know how you can try to hit. I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'll I don't work. know if This would be oil. a non-murder crime that I cover. Yeah. The crime is that you can't masturbate. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a moral crime. Cool. So okay. on that note, on that note, that's the end of my story. Oh, okay. Cool. That's the story of David Berkowitz, a.k.a. the son of Sam. And somehow we got talking about cornflakes. Yep. Okay. Son of Sam. Toucan Sam. Toucan son of Sam. How do we, How do we segue s- from this? What? How do we segue into this? Oh, I was just saying, like, how am I going to introduce my, my, my cryptid for the week? I don't, I don't know how. Um, well, spook me. Have you ever been to Dominica, St. Lucian, Trinidad, Guadalupe? 
Haiti, Louisiana, or Grenada? No, that is one area of the world that I have not been to. Okay. Um, well, I would then... know I should probably... Okay, one area of the United States that I have not been to, even though I really want to. I really want to go to New Orleans. Oh, yeah. Because the jazz scene there is fucking insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jazz scene, paranormal scene. Yeah. Um, queer scene, queer culture scene. I don't oh, know anything about New it. New Orleans is so good. I, really? What? Really, though? Yeah, yeah. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, it's like, it's like, I'm mostly it, one the of jazz, the first. Honestly. What? I'm mostly there for the jazz. Yeah. In New Orleans, I learned it in my queer studies class. It's like one of the first places in America where, like, queer people moved to and, like, gathered and created a whole community, or, like, community culture fascinating especially like black queer black queer men yeah i think is the specific i can see that but yeah yeah and it was like very like um progressive and cool until like white people started moving in so i mean yeah that (laughs) seems like it happens everywhere yeah um okay but so, if you haven't been here, you should visit, because this or because this area of the world is where the Sukhoyant lives. The what? Sukhoyant? What is that? Um, the Sukhoyant. is not like me. Shape-shifting character in Caribbean folklore. In, this, in these places, she is known as a hag figure. So, you should go, mm. and you should go visit her. And you know, maybe, try not. maybe I'll leave her alone. I don't, I'm not really a big fan of hag figures. Yeah. Unless they're specifically read as hags in my eighth grade yearbook. Oh yeah. These, these, these are kind of, kind of wild, but I got to say, so and when I was researching this, my online resources were very slim. Um, so most of my, most of my um, research came from, the very scarce Wikipedia, and then um, uh, trendofview.com, there's a long, like, written myth called uh, the Mayor, the Mayor, Mayaro Sukoyant, um, and then there's a few other sources, but, um, so kind of, kind of slim pickings, I think if I had more time, I would go to the library and try to, like, get older sources but um here we go yeah so um i actually heard about this this um uh uh shape-shifting shape-shift shape-shifter from one of my favorite books and it's called white is for witching and it's by helen oyemi and it's so good and a very unlikely place to find it because it's like about this haunted house in dover um, England. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, um, she wrote, uh, uh, other books like a boy snowbird. I don't know if you've heard of that one. Um, she just came out with a new one called gingerbread. It's really good. Um, but yeah, anyways, so I found out about this figure from that book and I've been fascinated ever since. So, the Sukuyant is um, a reclusive old woman by day and a vampiric hag by night. So. Oh, okay. I know. I can get on board with this. Yeah. Um, and so what happens is that at nightfall, she strips off her skin and hides it in a mortar. Nope. Off board. Off board. I don't like. Strips off her skin off. and hides it in a mortar. Wait, it gets better. Remember Bobby Yaga in, in the mortar? She, yeah. she was like, I, I don't know what it is with mortars, but um, um, that's what it says in, in Trinan, tr- Trinalisle.com. But okay. in Ill White is for Witching, in my favorite book, uh, it's said that she hides it in a cave. So I don't know, but she strips off her skin at night. Um, one source by uh, author Kurt Morris, Kurt with an I, um, specifies that uh, Sukoyans made mortars are made out of chocolate. 
and that in the Barbados, Bar- 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 she uh, will hide the skin in jars. So, mortars, chocolate mortars, and jars. jars. With like, skin in it. With skin in it. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm that, okay with the chocolate mortar, I think, because, like... It's chocolate. It's chocolate. But, yeah. like, skin? Yeah. yeah. What if you just find a jar, a jar of, of skin? Hag skin. Yeah. Ugh. Um, no, oh, thank you. But uh, we got some comic relief on the way. So after she sheds her skin, she then flies through the sky as a fireball, which is her true form. And she flies in search of victims. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is going on? Um, well, uh, here's what's going on. Is Please, that... Yes. Is that um, uh, the source by Kurt Morris um, offers a translation from the French Creole um, meaning man-eating sorcerer. So that's what's going okay. on here. Yeah. And I don't know if French Creole is the same as Louisiana French. But then there's also Louisiana Creole. So. I honestly could not tell you. I have no I idea. Don't know. I like researches for my novel at one point because my protagonist is supposed to be from New Orleans, but now I forget. Um, but they speak French dialects in September, so yeah, that's where it's from. Um, so the Sukoyant can enter homes through the smallest holes, cracks, crevices, and keyholes. Um, and here she will find people suck blood from their arms, legs, and, quote, soft parts while they sleep. (sighs) Um, This leaves blue-black marks on the body in the morning. Um, Nope. Nope, If she she draws too much blood from the body, the victim might die or become a sequent themselves, leaving, and then uh, and then they leave the killer to take their skin. So she'll like take their skin. I don't know if that, if that means that she shave or that she skins them and then takes the skin or she just occupies the body. But it said that this leaves the killer to take their skin. Yeah. Cause I'm like, if she's just a nice lady by day, like, Oh, she- She's not a nice lady. She's just an old hag lady. Okay. But she's a an old hag by day, an old vampire hag by night. An old so fireball I'm vampire. Fireball? Yeah. Her true vampire? form is a fireball. I don't know how... I'm just how wondering, a- like, how do you... Does she, okay, so she hides her skin in a cave, and then she has to go back to the cave to retrieve her skin, or uh-huh. she takes somebody else's body. We're not sure on that yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she definitely has to go back to the uh, to get her skin, or a skin, skin in the morning. <laughs> I yeah, This was just a one source that said that, that the Sukhoyant, like, uh, or, like... Sheds her skin. No, it, sorry. There's one source that says that a sequoiant can turn people into other sequoiants. So I don't know if that's just one but source. But they just be like her, her babies then. They're not like, she didn't possess their body. Mm, no. I don't, I just. I don't, I don't know either. I'm still stuck on like seeing skin in a jar. And I think that's really messing me up. Yeah, it is. It is a lot. Yeah. Um, well, on that note, can we talk about selkies at some point? What? <laughs> on that note, can we talk about selkies at some point? Selkies? They also shed their skin. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. More um, uh, personality traits about the sequoiant is that um, she is alleged to practice black magic and can trade her victim's blood for evil powers with Basil, the demon who lives in the silk cotton tree. Did you say Basil? B-A-S-I-L? B-A-Z-I-L. Same thing. Okay. My mom's cousin's husband's named Basil. With an S. (laughs) 
and now uh, I'm suspect. Yeah, so you're... Wait, you said your mom's friend? He's my uncle. Oh, oh. So your uncle is a demon who lives in the Silk Cotton Tree, just so you know. He's also, like, six foot five, so he might be the cotton tree itself. <laughs> so that's a bit about the Sukoyant herself. That would be, like, her dating profile, we can say. Mm-hmm. Um, so Sukoyant was probably formed as a combination between, like, European vampire myths and then, um, and then folklore of the enslaved Africans who were brought to to the Caribbean. Um, that would make sense. Yeah, and it kind of just made for a lot of wild stuff. So, um, the European vampire myth comes into comes into play when someone wants to protect themselves against a Sukhoyant. Um, one of Asukoyan's weaknesses is that when uh, is that she needs to be at home by dawn, otherwise she's gonna burn up in the morning sun. So like the whole wait, like, but she's a fireball. Yeah. So the sun is gonna like burn her, even though she's already burning. She's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. I'm not gonna question. Yeah. Folklore. Whatever. Fine. <laughs> um, um. Yeah. So um, that's like one of her limitations um so if you want to if you want to catch her you can scatter rice around your home or at uh at village crossroads because she's like one of those ocd like cryptids where she's like she has to pick up every single grain of rice one at a time and then so you can kind of just like try to outrun the clock and she'll probably be caught in the act um Hmm. And if you catch a sequoyant, you can put coarse salt in the mortar that contains her skin so that she won't be able to get back in or put the skin back on. Which is wild. I see. Yeah. I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, according... Yeah, so like, if you steal a selkie's skin, they can't turn into a seal anymore and they'll just permanently be a human. Yeah. Sorry, unrelated, but also related. Continue. Yeah. Um, also, in the whitest for witching version of this, there was a thing like, put salt and pepper in her skin, or you steal her skin, I think, and then she'll burn up in the morning sun. Um, according to Wiki, Sukoyans belong to a class of spirits called Jumbies, um, which will be its own episode at some point, because I need to do more research. That I know is coming from reliable sources and not from white people who went on a cruise to the Caribbean and have a blog about it. <laughs> um, oh, great. Yeah, I'm like gonna try to make this a story where I'm gonna like delve into um, research and like try to find like actual sources by the people who live there. From what I gathered um, through like my research and previous knowledge of like. Uh, Caribbean zombie folklore. Um, um, Jumbies are like, can be the spirits of people who did bad bad things and now in death they are instruments of evil. So that's kind of like zombies because like uh, the zombie myth originated from um, if, if, if you committed suicide then you would turn into a zombie because the punishment there would be that you have or um that you're going to be enslaved by someone else who can control your corpse because it was an unclean death kind of thing i see okay thus making the horrors of slavery like something that extends into death so kind of a deterrent of um suicide yeah um, so yeah, so just that kind of thing. So yeah, there's a theory that Sorquayans are instruments of evil because they were bad people. Yeah, so I couldn't find like a lot of actual like myths and like folklore stories on the internet. Um, I found one, but it was really long and Cody and I talked about it and we were kind of like, we don't know if it's okay to read full length stories from sources on our podcast. So I'm just right, gonna, yeah. yeah, I'm just gonna include the link um, in Instagram. Yeah. Um, 
But um, I'm going to end with a lovely analysis um, that came under the myth um, of the Mayoro Sukoyant. This was on Trinity.com. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and quote from this source, but it's a lot shorter. Um, cool. And so their thoughts on it were, um, quote, Old Women of the Village is a traditional evil character in the folklore of many cultures. Where does it come from? A socio-historical explanation may be ventured here. Women naturally live longer than men, and more often than not, a woman lived to a great age, whereas her husband would die younger, in war, because of sickness, or through an accident. Old people were more often than not women, not men. Furthermore, in traditional cultures, women did enjoy the same rights as men. They are, wait, there's, there are many accounts of widows being total outcast, oh, of widows being total outcasts in village life. People of the, vi- of the village coveted her land and her possessions for themselves, especially if the women had no sons of her own to protect her. So the ugly, wrinkled, and lonesome old woman from, was a burden to village life, just, an, just another mouth to feed. Because she was a woman, no one was interested in her personal life, experience, and wisdom. When she had no protectors, people invented with stories around her, and in the end killed her, sharing her possessions, her land, her house, and her livestock amongst themselves. So take the sequence story with a grain of coarse salt. <laughs> wow, okay. I just thought that that was so great. I like it a lot because I feel like it applies to a lot of like um myths about Stories. women turning into yeah. evil things. Um so yeah, that's the story of the sequel. Yeah. Creepy. I yeah. hate it. I hate skin. Like, I love it. Definitely stems from my fear of snakes. Yeah, no, like, when I think of, like, skin in a jar. I know that there's nothing wrong with snakes. Like, I've held a snake. It's fine. I just, skin. Snake skin. It's not for me. Yeah, I had had (laughs) gecko in high school, and it was always so gross when he was shedding, Mm -hmm. because geckos will also eat their skin. That's right. Yeah, they eat their skin because they don't want predators to track them, and also no, takes a lot work. of energy. That's so to smart. Shed skin, so then they want to go back and eat it again. Get wow, it. I okay. know. Okay, Ugh. but here's here's the real contradiction. Why am I okay with peeling dried glue off my fingers, but not shedding actual skin? Because it like it's like living. And it's part of an animal. And it's just like... I don't know. I really just... Well, also, like, <laughs> snakes and, like, lizards, like, shed their whole body. But, like, if you were, like, shedding... If you have, like, a dry patch of skin on your hand, then it's not, like, just your whole body is schlucking off. Yeah, I don't... Ugh. Okay. I think, yeah, because yeah, you're right. I think it's because I expect there to be, like, like... Raw flesh underneath, oh, but then yeah, it's just yeah. fine. Yeah, that might be part of it. Yeah, or so Ugh. my gecko okay. was always super soft after he shedded. Mm-hmm. Um, All right, I want to leave the horror corner now. Uh, I want to put truly everything horrible, horrific. scary, and spooky behind and get some. I want to keep it's talking about, that about time my dissection experience. Sorry, what? I, for one, want to keep talking about my dissection experience, but I can oh I can do that with Hollis. Um, you can record your own episode and post it on Patreon. Patreon.com slash podcast. L exclusive. L exclusive. Dissection experience exclusive. But, like, I need someone to talk to. I guess I can talk to my, like, Alexa device or something. <laughs> She's the only Pretend person I like talk Susan. to anyways. Maybe Susan will enjoy the horrors of dissection. Yeah. But then that's just... Just go back to school and get your biology degree. <laughs> that's just weird because no one else ever seems to be able to hear it when Susan talks back to me. Just one of those things. You gotta call uh, Dr. Doolittle. Oh, yeah. Aren't they making it. a remake of Dr. Doolittle? 
Yeah, with Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, right except it's a white guy. And I'm like, yeah. no. And it's like fantastical creatures or whatever. Like, Ew. it seems really just fantasy based. And I'm like, like no, Dr. Doolittle can't. Very I'm sorry. stripped of its original. Like, if you read the book or whatever, it well, was actually like, that's the more true telling of it. Hmm. But, like, honestly, I grew up with the other one. And I grew up with Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I can't. Robert Downey Jr. cannot replace Eddie Murphy. No one can replace Eddie Murphy. Nope. Think about if someone else did Donkey and Shrek. Where would we I, be? Where would society be? We yeah, would be okay, nowhere. So Dr. Doolittle originally came out in 1967. And it was like this fantastical white guy at his fucking nature zoo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fucking white guy in his nature suit and then Dr. Doolittle with Eddie Murphy came out in 1998 there was a book 1998 that's one year after I was born wow let's see here where's the book where's the book where's the book nope the first novel had originally been filmed in 1967 as a musical excuse me I just choked yeah that's disgusting i don't like musicals to begin with okay so the film was inspired by the series of children's stories of the same name by hugh lofting when was that written i don't feel like i know who hugh lofting is dr doolittle stories were written in 1839 huh Wait, so uh, i guess it would be a white guy frolicking in his nature zoo and eddie murphy's hmm. the one who went and diverted from Modernized. the original text. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, that does sound like a very Victorian thing. Like, mm-hmm. fantastical man white man his, in his nature suit? What? The yeah. White man in his nature <laughs> the suit. white man in his nature suit. Tarzan. Same era. Yeah. White Except, man in his nature suit. What? Wait, it Never was mind. Tarzan white? Yes. What? Really? Because he, yes, his family were a bunch of white explorers and they left him there. Oh, because, I. Okay, technically they didn't leave him there. They were attacked and killed by a jaguar. Oh. Uh, they accidentally what? left him there. <laughs> I, you know what? I never really liked Tarzan as a kid, so I don't think that I've seen it past like the age of seven. So I didn't catch yeah, on so to his that. His parents were killed by the jaguar. And so his like life goal is to kill. Excuse you, motorcycle, who thinks they have an inferior already. Isn't that so annoying? I just get so angry every time someone zooms by in a fancy car. I'm like, do you know about the Seattle homelessness crisis? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so his whole life plan is to, like, kill the jaguar leopard that killed his parents. To me, he just just looks like like a person of color because... Well, that's the thing. Like, he's, like, extremely tan because he's, like always in the sun he's got dreads because he's never fucking heard of a shower yeah huh. and he doesn't speak english because he grew up with apes i guess that's low-key really racist yeah not even not low-key. low-key like not actually low-key. high-key god damn it <laughs> okay well i'll send you a great video about it okay please do yeah because yeah. okay should have seen that one coming Anyways, okay. Um, we right, should close out because corner. we're almost great like episodes. You can find us on the internet. <laughs> we're on the internet, Cody. We're on the internet. You can find us on the internet at patreoncom slash Four Corner Podcast. You can find web. us at Four Corner Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, um, YouTube, where all of our episodes are. Um, our episodes are now also up on Spotify. iHeartRadio. Yeah, iHeartRadio. Um, it should be up on Google Podcasts eventually. Oh. I'm not sure when that's going to happen, but when yeah. they refresh it, it'll be there. Also, so, iTunes. Uh, Soon. It's going to happen. I'm going to figure out how to do it. Well, well, we'll get it. We'll get it. You'll be able to soon listen to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Yeah. Until then, find us on YouTube and Spotify. Mm-hmm. And... I too. I heart. I heart radio. I'm hungry.
<laughs> we gotta go. Ooh, ooh, we right. gotta go. Um, okay, well that's that's it, folks. Thanks, thanks for coming to the corner. We want to leave, so we're going to All go right. now. Um, All right. Thanks for listening. I'm Al. Thank you. I'm Cody. All right. And this is the horror corner. Thanks so much. We will talk Bye. to you next week. Bye.